take off your solar eclipse shades. It's time for another episode of Finn Side the NFL. We had WrestleMania and we had a solar eclipse. Had a lot going on the past couple of days, but we got a lot to talk about, including are the Miami Dolphins targeting Dalton Reisner if their draft options fall through. Also, we will talk about Tier Tart and rubbing Christian Wilkins fans the wrong way already. Plus, we'll talk about a few prospects the Miami Dolphins are bringing in and doing homework on. Also, a reunion with Ogba. It may be still possible. Plus, I will give my top 15 offensive tackle big board for the 2024 NFL draft. So do me the favor, smash the like button, subscribe if you're new. Let's get into this. You have got to be kidding me. Jalen Waddle has a dolphin touchdown. What is good, Finn Nation? What's good? It's your boy Reason, and we are back here for another one. I hope everyone is having a great start to their week, whether you saw the solar eclipse or not, had to take your kids out of school or not. I hope it has been a fantastic day, and wherever you are, I hope it continues to get better, whether you're still at work, on your way home from work, already home, or you've been home all day. Shout out to you and wherever you are you are thank you so much for coming through and showing some support and thank you for all that support on that tr tart video appreciate it let's get that same support for this video because a lot of work went into this video we got the offensive tackle big board listen this is going to be my fourth big board of six for all of you and already out of the three i've done two of them have been demonetized and i'm fully expecting this video to get demonetized off the Notre Dame footage of Joe Alt alone. So if you can smash the like button, please do me the favor. If you aren't subscribed, please subscribe. And if you have the financial means, every dollar counts on these type of videos where YouTube and XOS digital sports are about to take all of my ad revenue. So thank you. There is that note. The only shows I really ever ask for donations or request donations are these big board shows. So because a lot of work goes into these in terms of the evaluations, the film watching, the film clipping, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, anyways, so shout out to all of you for supporting the channel and supporting me for patrons and channel members. I do have an update coming for all of y'all. I was just, you know, busy this weekend. Plus, there wasn't a lot to talk about, but I do have some stuff to go over for all of you. So expect that update either to come tonight or tomorrow morning. All right. It's going to come one or the other for you for you guys. And we got a few things to talk about on that update. Um, you know, we're going to talk about Tua. We're going to talk about um, the edge position and the injuries there. So, yeah, um, shout out to all of y'all. Okay, two things I got to get to because I saw someone ask me in the last show before it went. What did I think about Kendrick? Uh, sorry, J. Cole's response to Kendrick. I thought it was a warning shot. I thought it was decent. I don't think it was anything crazy. But then I saw J. Cole out here apologizing to Kendrick. Are you for real right now? Oh, my God. I thought, be, I thought you know. I thought we were about to get a, a, a legitimate battle and we got people out here already apologizing for dissing people. So 
2024 hip hop. What else can you say? Um, yeah. So uh, also, how did I like WrestleMania? WrestleMania was fantastic. Uh, I thought night one was okay. You know, six and a half out of 10 ish type thing. I thought the main event, I thought the Sammy match, um, I thought the Rhea Ripley match. I thought those were really strong matches. Night two blew it out of the water though. All right. Uh, First of all, that rock entrance on night one was ridiculous. Night two was yesterday. And listen, I loved seeing how that, you know, that overbooked crazy main event was wild. But I would have rather Austin coming out. I would have rather hearing some glass shattering than bell tolls. All right. That would have been massive if Austin could have came out and he was the one that cleared out the rock. Now I get it, you know. Undertaker's been battling that bloodline, you know, all the way back for quite some time. I get it, but still, you know, go back to Yokozuna. He's been battling that bloodline. So, I, you know, I get it, but, man, Austin just would have blown the proverbial roof off that place because there was no roof. Um, Bro, that little Wayne entrance was the worst. I, I didn't think he could get worse. I didn't think it could get worse than that little Wayne entrance. And then Jay and Jimmy had the match. Holy jeez, man. That was brutal. For all that buildup and for them being twin brothers, they had absolutely zero chemistry. My God. So, shout out to all of you for coming through. <sighs> shout out to the American Nightmare. I mean, I've been following him since day one, since... You know, he was doing his thing with Randy Orton and Ted DiBiase Jr. You know, through the Stardust, I really became a huge Cody fan during his Ring of Honor run and New Japan Pro Wrestling run. So, and then obviously in AEW, obviously a huge fan. So, shout out to Cody Rhodes for finishing the story. The question now is, will he be able to keep the fans on his side and fans captivated now that the chase is gone. Now that that chase aspect is no longer part of his gimmick, his story. It's going to be interesting to see if he can still keep eyes captivated and he can still stay burning hot pop in terms of popularity. Cause not a lot of guys would have recovered after losing at 39 and having the fans wait another year for him to finally finish it. Not a lot of guys would have been able to do that. So shout out to Cody. Um, and shout out to Roman Reigns for that, you know, for that rain that, that, was, that was quite the rain from Roman and the story ain't done because we about to see my boy Tama Tonga show up. All right. They signed Jacob Fatu. So it's going to get interesting over there. But anyways, y'all are here for some football. I know Roman Reigns played football, but we ain't here to talk about that. We got a lot to cover. First thing I want to cover for all of you. I see people trying to say this could be a tough year for the Miami Dolphins and oh this could be the toughest year in the last decade or two and da, 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 da. the fear mongers are out in full force. Let me ask you this. Are we about to relive the Joe Philbin era? Are we about to relive the one in fifteen Cam Cameron season? Oh, hell, you want to be recent? Are we about to relive the rebuild year of Flores' first year? No, to all three of those things. So you tell me how this could be the toughest year in the last multiple decades or the last decade even. All right? If you a real Dolphin fan, you done been through it the last 20 years, okay? And also, you know, what's this assuming? Everyone wants to play the odds. We want to play the odds, right? Let's play the odds, right? Tua Tungvaloa wins 65% of his games in the NFL. Tua Tungvaloa has not had a losing season in the NFL. Tua Tungvaloa is coming off a team with back-to-back -back playoff appearances. You really think we're about to just crap the bed and win seven or eight games? Come on. Like, what, what are we talking about right now? Like, what are we talking about right now? It, it, it's just... Absolute nonsense. It makes absolutely no sense. There's no basis or foundation to that argument. Like, come on, man. It's bad enough you got people out here that don't know how a quarterback coach will benefit 
to a tongue of Aloha because they don't understand the position or what comes with using a, a, a high level quarterback coaching institute like 3D QB. But now you got people out here just straight up making up nonsense. All right. And speaking of, let's talk about that 3D QB because I see a narrative that's been going around. And I got to dead this. I got to dead this and I got to dead it right quick. People are trying to be out here and be like, oh, I can't wait to wait it five whole years until he got a head, until he got a quarterback coach. Where y'all been? Where y'all been? To have been had a quarterback coach. What are we talking about? What are we talking about here? You want evidence? Okay, I'll give you the evidence. It's pictures from 2021. That man in the black cutoff is Wes Carroll of quarterback prep. He's a quarterback coach. He was working with Tua with Perform. All that happened is Tua upgraded. Now Tua is working with 3D QB and 3D QB. They work with 26 of the 32 starters across the NFL. So I don't know what this whole narrative is that Tua Tungvaloa has never had a quarterback coach before. I don't know who said this. I don't know who started this. I don't know who's trying to jump on this. Like, what are we talking about right now? Tua Tungvaloa done been had quarterback coach. Now he's going to the cream of the crop. Oh, yeah. Now he's going to the cream of the crop. That's what's happened. He's elevated. Tua Tungvaloa has gotten better every offseason. Y'all really don't think he's going to get better with 3D QB? The consistency in the kinetic energy transfer chain from toes to fingertips, something I've been talking about since I've been in this community because when I discuss Tom House, that alone is going to bring more velocity. That alone is going to clean up his mechanics, his footwork, right? They're going to clean up his footwork from energy transfer all the way to accuracy and pocket footwork. They are going to crispen and tighten up everything to it does. And see, this is why I don't get. How do you think Tom Brady played until into his 40s? Remember, Tom Brady did not get with Tom House till 2012. Tom Brady had been in the league for over 10 years by the time he got to Tom House. He was like Tua, using quarterback coaches none of y'all ever heard of. His quarterback coach actually passed away, and then he went to Tom House. Drew Brees. Drew Brees, because I had someone say, oh, you're trying to tell me... This is going to magically transform to a da 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 da. Go talk to Drew Brees. Go look at what Tom House and 3D QB did for Drew Brees' career after that shoulder surgery. The same shoulder injury that caused us to pass on Drew Brees for Dante Culpepper. Yes, that same injury. When he had that, who'd he go to? Tom House. What did Tom House do? Crispin, Titan, rework his mechanics, and what happened? You had a guy with a pop gun arm from year six, year seven into the league after that shoulder surgery that lasted until he was 40. Why? Because mechanics. Mechanics are going to... Footwork is going to maximize your accuracy. It's also going to be a part of maximizing the kinetic chain. Right? Things as... Uh, things... As simple as your elbow, man. Right? Uh, uh, you see quarterbacks when they throw, you got the elbow in front. Brother, what do you think that affects? East, west, north, south accuracy as well. Right? You you, you come too high with that arm, that ball is going to come up too. Right? You got to keep them nice, tight, and, and, and compact right against the chest. And that helps you drive. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, they're going to maximize a lot of the things 
you need out of a quarterback through just mechanics. And perfect or as close to perfect mechanics will outlast natural arm strength, will outlast mobile legs. Your legs start to go in your 30s. Your arms start to die in your 30s. Think about it. Think about this. Let's say a quarterback's 35 years old. 35 years old. Think about how long he's been throwing a football for. Think about it. By the time they're 35, they've been throwing a football for around 30 years. From Pee Wee to Pop Warner to high school to college to the big show. Think of how many reps that is on the arm. Your arm's just going to naturally die. But what happens? Mechanics lets you get squeeze every ounce of juice out of that arm. Mechanics are how you can last till you're 40. Just trying to live off God-given ability like your legs or your arms, it's only going to take you so long and so far. So, you know what? I'm still shocked. I'm still shocked the media isn't covering this. You know, I'm going to tell you this. I know the homie Bobby Shouse was the first to take it to Twitter. I confirmed it directly with Nick Hicks. I spoke to Nick Hicks. I know all these guys in the media have written pieces about Nick Hicks and what he's done with Tua. It's like it's not like they can't all reach out. Listen, jujitsu helped him sustain, you know, helped him stay durable. Working with 3D QB could help him consistently be a top five, top three quarterback in the NFL. This is a bigger development than the jujitsu. But what? Because they could mock the jujitsu? Because, you know, it wasn't what they would consider normal. Yet, if they did their research, they would see offensive lines have been practicing in this. There's, you know, former players that have started, you know, training companies that go around and train players this, like at the college level and stuff. Dude, jujitsu is, is more niche, so it's not recognized. But, uh, you know... I'm just surprised with how big of a of a click magnet Tua is. No one's covered this. No one's taking the time to reach out to Nick Hicks. Come on. South Florida Don, he got my back. He says, say no to demonetization. Buddy, I want to tell you something. YouTube already takes 30% off that cut. So you just donated $10. I see seven. Now, with demonetization, they, that does not impact donations. That's why I ask people to donate. It just, they take away my ad revenue. So, you know, and what's uh, it's like, I mean, you know, I'll give you perfect examples here, okay? Perfect examples so you guys can, you guys can hear what I'm talking about. Let me, let me pull up and tell you because the last one I got, I got nailed for and it was a couple, uh, I'll tell you exactly what games I got nailed for last time. Okay, so... Last time when I did the edge big board, right? If you guys remember the edge big board, um, the edge big board, I got hit for Tennessee versus Alabama and Old Miss versus Alabama. That's what I got hit for on that one. When I did the, um, what was this? Wide receiver big board. The wide receiver big board, I got hit for Arkansas versus LSU, Army versus LSU, and then Arkansas versus LSU again because I had two guys in the top five right i had uh so i was using that arkansas game multiple times over so there you go two out of my three big boards and i know that notre i'm expecting to get demonetized for the notre dame footage i really am i'm not even lying so shout out to to you south florida don for showing a little love and supporting the channel a little bit so you know i appreciate that sir what's going on brad what's going on everyone in the chat one thing too, I know, you know, everyone sees mock drafts and, you know, and I don't overdo mock drafts on Twitter or here. I try to make them meaningful and I try to make them count. But last night after WrestleMania, I decided to do a mock draft just to see what would happen. And I didn't think the perfect mock draft existed. And then I decided to open up the PFN mock simulator. Check this one out. All right. Check this one out. All right. 
Look at that. Look at that. All right. Uh, Johnny Newton at 26. Xavier Leggett at 55. Peyton Wilson at 59. Mason McCormick at 123. Dallin Holker at 198. And Gabriel Murphy at 241. Holy. Tell me that ain't a nice one, eh? Tell me that ain't a nice one. And how did I move up? Simple. I got, uh, for pick 20. One, I got 26 and 57 for 21 and 158. Then I turn around and um, I traded 57 and 184 for 59 and 123. Now, I say all that to say this. We all know Greer ain't going to ever be that active in a draft. So this is literally nothing more than a pipe dream. But my God, what a win this would be. My Lord. What a win this would be. I see people asking about PayPal in, in the uh, chat. I had, um, uh, I, I've had issues with PayPal. Um, so I'm going to be opening up a new way for y'all to pay through PayPal with a new account. Currently right now that PayPal account is not accepting money and it's, uh, you know, they're, they're just, they're just being ridiculous about something. So, uh, I went to verify the account and it turned into this whole big mess. So my PayPal, you're not able to donate through that right now, but I am looking to change that. I'll, I'll try and get that changed this week. Okay. Cause I see fake spike and a few others saying that's our blessed reason, et cetera, et cetera. So I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I'll bring PayPal back, um, this week right now. It's just, it's just being a hassle. So appreciate all y'all. Um, all right now, Continuing on here, let's get into the news. Let's start off, all right, with Dalton Reisner and how the Miami Dolphins. I don't have zeal. Zeal's not in Canada. Um, let's start off with Dalton Reisner, and and here we go. Um, there's some interesting. This is from three days ago, actually, from um Barry Jackson. A few things in here, a few nuggets in here, so. This is talking about the guard position, all right? Now, the Dolphins have had pre preliminary conversations with representatives for several free veteran free agent starting guards and even brought one into team headquarters earlier this season, Phil Haynes, so that's nothing new. Unless something changed at the moment, and that's always possible with the Dolphins, the message has been consistent with several of them. Your player's on our list. We might add a veteran guard. Let's stay in touch. But we might want to get through the draft and address this later. That's according to multiple people in touch with the Dolphins' front office. For now, the Dolphins aren't in terrible shape at the position. They have a very solid left guard starter in Isaiah Wynn, albeit one who has dealt with injuries throughout his career. They have serviceable options to replace Carolina-bound Robert Hunt, in Robert Jones, Liam Eikenberg, and Lester Cotton. They have a first-round pick in a draft position considered a sweet spot for natural guards and tackles who can play guard. That's the range for Oregon guard center Jackson Powers Johnson and Graham Barton. Man, Graham Barton at 21 is such a reach. Who can play all five positions but is reportedly rising up draft boards. If the Dolphins eventually want to add a veteran starter, here's who's left among free agents. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Dalton Reisner. And this is the interesting part. He's among a half dozen or so names that would be on Miami's list if the Dolphins choose to sign a veteran in a couple of months. Now, that matters because he wouldn't say that if he hadn't heard that internally. Barry Jackson isn't like that. So that right there is telling you there is interest if we do not get a guard or an interior option through the draft, there is interest in Dalton Reisner and the Miami Dolphins. He started at least 15 games for Denver every season from 2019 to 2022, then started 11 of 15 appearances for Minnesota last year. Didn't allow a sack in 485 pass blocking snaps last season. All 4,518 career snaps have come at left guard, where win was a good fit before season-ending quadriceps injury in Week 7. That, to me, I mean, come on. That's a fantastic option, and that's a fantastic position battle. So, I'm just saying, now that we know Dalton Reisner is legitimately on their list, 
that is very, very intriguing for me, at least, when you talk about center options. Now he goes on to talk about uh, Greg Van Rotten. Um, he spelled his last name wrong. Uh, Lakin Tomlinson, who, you know, that makes a ton of sense as being one of the guys they might have talked to. All right. Um, Andres Pete getting old, but he was a stud next to Teron Armstead. Cody Whitehair, he's a guy who I said they should have traded for. Right? He can he you know, he can play left guard, center, or right guard. Cody Whitehair is interesting. Again, he's over 30, but that's an on a one year deal. I'm intrigued. Haynes, you know, never signed after his visit, but he cannot be ruled out by any means because Miami liked him enough to fly him into team headquarters that, that last month. So there you go. All right. Then it gets into Mark Lewinsky, Lewis, Patrick, Nick Gates, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, for me here, if you said reason, who would you want on this list? Reisner, because of familiarity with Butch Berry, if they're interested in him, clearly him and Barry have Butch Berry have a better relationship than we all originally assumed. So Dalton Reisner would be there for me. He'd be an option for me. Um, I like Cody Whitehair. Cody Whitehair, because he can play left guard, right guard, center. That would be another him. They, those would be my top two options. Then you'd get like Lake and Tomlinson and such. But I'm going to tell you, out of all these names, whoever it is, one year deal. One year deal. That way, if a guy falls to you in your lap at 55, or you end up picking up a, a, a pick in the third or fourth round, and a guard you like falls to you, you're not committed. You got a one-year deal. You you need you need that. You cannot let good players stop you. I say this all the time. Never let good players stop you from selecting great players. And you know, to me, the guard position. Listen, it's it's vital. I I keep saying to you, and I'll keep saying to you. There, I, I just do not see any way that they continue on throughout this offseason with status quo as is. I just don't see it. It just doesn't seem reasonable to me. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, right? It just doesn't. So... That's where I'm at. The, that's where they're at with the current market. But the interest in Dalton Reisner is legit. It is real. So, you know, that, that's, that's what it is, man. I'm interested. I like how they're, again, you know, we liked how they were chasing kind of big names and uh, wide receiver. I like the fact that they're chasing the top guards on the market right now. And they're playing it smart. They know what's going to happen. Teams are going to draft guards and drive prices down further. And there's going to be a point where some of these guys are going to get desperate just to hop on a team. That's where we're at right now. Literally, that's where we're at. They're sitting here saying, listen, if we don't get one of our guys to drop to us and other teams get their guy, it's just going to drive your market down further. And one of these guys is going to get desperate to play football. Um, can win kick to right guard? Not ideal for him. Left guard. He's a left side guy. You see the way he moves. You see how comfortable he is. He's a left side guy, right? Just like right tackle didn't work. Now you could kick him to right guard, but I don't think it would be overly successful. Good question, though. I appreciate that, EJ. So, you know, he, he's he's a left side guy. And I think left guard's a sweet spot. He's just got to stay healthy. Now, if he stays healthy, listen, I'm going to tell you honestly. If he stays healthy all year in the playoffs, you don't need Dalton Reisner. But given his history, you need a backup option. We can't go through what we went last year where that interior was just a mess by the end of it. We can't. So, can't afford it, man. Tier Tart. Tier Tart is going to make a lot of Wilkins fans mad. All right. 
Look at this. Tier Tart number 94. Number 94. Look at this. Coming for you Christian Wilkins fans. He ain't messing around. Huh? He is not messing around. He said, give me that. I saw fans were already, <clears throat> were already, listen, time waits for no man. It always keeps moving forward. That's just what it is. And that is just even a further reality that we are going to see someone else in number 94 this year. What else can you say? What else can you say? Who's the best right gar sorry, right tackle coming out of the draft? Uh Talise Fuaga. Because he would be my high, highest rated right tackle. But let me tell you this. You talking about a draft full of right tackles. The G's Louise. Whoever's drafting Penix, the blindside protector is in this draft. This is a draft full of right tackle options. Now there's guys who I think can make the switch to left tackle. We'll talk about it when we get into my big board. If Thomas fell to 21, would you pick him reason? All depends on what the board looks like. If Troy Fatanu is on the board, I'm probably taking Fatanu. All right. So that, that's just that's just where I'm at. But shout out to Tier Tart ripping the Band-Aid off for all of you Dolphin fans. Just ripping it off saying that man is gone. All right. Now, here's the question. What do we do at edge? I dropped a big board. We need another edge rusher. You know, I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about the injuries at edge in my Patreon update. But Cam Good, Chubb, and Phillips, there's no guarantee either one of those guys are going to be there to start the season. That's just where it's at. So what, are we rolling out Shaq Barrett and give us our give us your best practice squad, guys? I don't see it. So, look, sticking with Barry Jackson, he had something interesting here. Could Emmanuel Ogba be an option that's still on the table for the Miami Dolphins. So he says Dolphins need another edge rusher too. Here's what's left in free agency. The injury ravaged Dolphins were so needy for edge rushers in January that they added three in the days before their playoff game in Kansas City. Justin Houston, Bruce Servant, and Malik Reed. More than a month into free agency, they find themselves in a precarious position with just one healthy proven edge player out slash outside linebacker under contract and that's Shaq Barrett, who had four and a half sacks last year for Tampa Bay. Jalen Phillips, who tore an Achilles on the day after Thanksgiving, could be back for the season opener, but that's iffy. Bradley Chubb, torn ACL on December 31st, could be back in the first half of the season, but that remains to be seen. And Cameron Good is very much in question for the start of the season. The Dolphins likely will add another two or three edge rushers in the draft process. UDFAs, there you go. Perhaps with one or two of their six picks and then in the undrafted rookie free agent market afterward. Miami has picks in the first round, second round, fifth round, and seventh round, and two picks in the sixth round. But they need at least one more veteran rusher. Miami could pick through a group of remaining free agents or wait and see who, who gets cut after the draft. They also could draft a 21 with UCLA's Leatu Latu and Missouri's Darius Robinson considered the best options. Here's who will be available among accomplished free agent pass rushers. Emmanuel Ogba, he was released in February so the Dolphins could avoid a big cap hit with a $16 million salary. A return isn't entirely out of the question. So there you go. You know Barry's asked about that. You know Barry's inquired about that, given their needs. But Ogba has had more success as a hand in the ground and than a stand-up outside linebacker, at least during his Dolphins tenure. He was still productive as a rusher last season with six sacks and 19 pressures. And 144 passing snaps. He goes on to name Yannick Ngaku, Ngaku um, Kalias Campbell, Tyus Bowser, um, who that would be interesting, right? He's just, again, injury riddled. 
injury riddled. That's it. But he has experience with Weaver, like it says there. Bud Dupree, Marcus Golden, Carl Lawson, James Smith Williams, Jerry Hughes, and so on and so forth, including Justin Houston still out there, Melvin Ingram, Bruce Irvin, Malik Reed, Charles Harris. That would be funny, eh? That would be funny if they brought back Charles Harris. Um, I like Emmanuel Ogba as the best fit here, given how well he knows the personnel and what he can do. Um, Ngakwe and, and, and Campbell and Bowser do also make sense. Do also make sense. So does Bud Dupree, let's be honest. So there are options, veteran options on the table for the Miami Dolphins still. But could a reunion with Emmanuel Ogba be in the cards? Let me know in the chat. What now? Let me know in the chat or let me know in the comments if you're watching after. Would you rather bring back Ogba on a team-friendly deal or would you like to take an edge rusher with the first or second pick? Now, I'm not including UDFAs or anything like that. Would you rather take an edge rusher at 21 or 55 or bring back Ogba into the fold and then worry about getting a rotational piece later in the draft in the sixth round or UDFA? Let me know in the chat. What would you rather, Ogba or drafting a guy? Well, the Miami Dolphins, they're doing their research. And this is where they're at. This in-state first-round draft possibility would give Miami an unstoppable pass rush. What's the fastest way from Tallahassee to Miami? For Florida State pass rusher Jared Verse, it might be via Detroit. Versus one of a dozen players believed to be unconsider under consideration by the Miami Dolphins with pick 21 of the NFL draft. Okay, and then he's going to go um, into what, what he is, et cetera, et cetera. Now, let's get into it here because, uh, you know, I can tell you, I don't need to read all that. Like, I, I've already done a big board for all of you. I will tell you right now. He was my third edge rusher. What do I like about him? A little over 6'3 and a half, 254. Pops off the screen as a high-level athlete with some of the best strength in the in the edge class. Has really strong his hands. Knows how to use them well. Places them well. Distru disrupts linemen with, with punches, clubs, chops, and rips, and double-handed swipes. Has really some clean hands. Has a pretty vast array of pass rush moves. He can win with um, whether it's a you know he can use he can beat you with technique or he can beat you with power. Very explosive first step, is quick in short areas, has a motor that never stops, shows good instincts and high, high level awareness in terms of, you know, not getting caught out of position for play action and misdirection. Keeps a good pad level. You never see him coming into the point of attack too high. Can stack and shed defenders pretty easily. Um, can set the edge. Um, he's well rounded against the run in the pass. Biggest issue for me is his bend is average. Um, he isn't that great in open space and he can clean up his tackling technique just a little bit, but that's my scouting report on him, right? Shout out to BA 1282 sound mine for the $2 donation. Appreciate that, sir. Appreciate that a ton. All goes a long way on this video where it's probably going to get demonetized. Let's be honest because of the all 22. So. He goes on here and says, Verse is firmly on the Dolphins' radar. He hinted as much during his combine news conference saying he was drawn interest from a couple Florida-based teams. He went a step forward during an appearance on PFT Live, sharing a fun story involving Mike Daniel. During their meeting with Daniel, stumped the two-time All-American when he asked him to list his favorite song verse. And he said, you know why I got that question for you? Your last name. Uh, it, it was kind of bypass my head so it says versus on a very short list of players that could be the first edge defender taken in a couple weeks i think it's layatu latu or dallas turner who's gonna be the first two off darius robinson now darius robinson he keeps lumping him in with an edge darius robinson is more than just an edge player darius robinson can play three tech like what are we talking about Dar darius robinson is an interior defensive lineman who can play edge as well. He's an interior to edge. Um, and verse said, he thinks he's a, a great player, you know? So there you go. The Miami dolphins are firmly interested in one of the top pass rushers.
of this draft class. Shout out to Brad Martin coming through with five NFL memberships pro special. Robert Trainer, Mike Wright, Josh Hart, and JC Arenas all are the recipients of those five inside the NFL memberships. Appreciate that, Brad. Appreciate you, the mod, for helping build the community. Um, so we got over 350 of you in the chat. Smash the like button. Subscribe if you are new. Listen. I wouldn't be mad with Darius Robinson, Chop Robinson, or Jared Verse, Leatu Latu at 21. I, I wouldn't. Just like I wouldn't be mad with Johnny Newton at 21. I'd love it. So, it is what it is. You know, it's just they're doing their due diligence. And plus, when I see that they're looking at guys like Verse, thank God I did those, those big boards for all y'all. Right? Jeez Louise, huh? Um, continuing on here for each and every one of you guys, we got more to get into as the Miami Dolphins. Let's talk about another prospect they are interested in as the Dolphins. They're bringing in a running back who led college football in touchdowns just a few years ago. So the Miami Dolphins could conceivably return to the same running back room that began last season. Mozart, A-Chan, Wilson, Ackman, and Chris Brooks all under contract with Ackman needing several more months to recover from last year's foot injury. But that stability hasn't stopped Miami from exploring potential additions. Dolphins officials are intrigued by the skill set of Marshall running back Rasheen Ali and are flying him to team headquarters to meet with Dolphins officials in the next 10 days. According to a league source, Ali will count as one of the Dolphins maximum 30 permitted South Florida visits with prospects who have no previous ties to the Tri-County area. Ali, 5'11", 260, sorry, 206 pounds. Imagine if he was 260 running back. Average 5.5 yards per carry and scored 39 touchdowns on 514 rushing attempts in 34 games over four years at Marshall. As a receiver, he caught 75 passes for 557 yards and three touchdowns. As a returner, he averaged 34.6 yards on five kickoff returns and brought back one for a touchdown. 2021, he led FBS, the FBS in rushing touchdowns. He had 23. And total touchdowns, he had 25. Um, so um, he's a Cleveland native. Senior Bowl Executive Director Jim Nagy raved about Ali on social on X last week. He said, there's no verified 40 times on Rasheen Ali. Teams we've spoken with have him almost 22 miles per hour in game speed. His explosive cut up on PFF Ultimate has tons of angle busting long distance runs. Could have picked 20 other clips where Ali just dusts people. Ali's instant acceleration and hard plant downhill cuts cuts make him an ideal fit for wide zone teams, which is why he fits with us, right? So now he's just going to get in and tell you what other people are saying about him. So I'll tell you what I think about him. Ali is one of those guys who he's a home run hit always waiting to happen. Anytime that guy cuts the ball, sorry, touches the ball, he's one angle or one cut away from taking it to the house. That's just how he's built. Um, now, you know, listen, this guy, he moves in a flash too. He moves in an absolute flash. So, you know, listen, this is a guy who, He's got a lot of talent. I mean, someone asked me last week about sleepers. I'd put him as a sleeper. You know, everyone's talking about Wright and all these other guys, you know, and Benson. But Ali's a sleeper, man. I mean, you're talking about a guy who's got top-level acceleration and speed to match, right? Knows how to gear down and gear back up instantly without losing anything, you know? Um... He has really great footwork, really great footwork, really clean footwork. They're so fast. Um, he shows patience. He, you know, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't overextend himself and just, you know, try to hit gaps as soon as he lets the, the blocks develop and the play develop and then he hits. And he's, a, he's elusive, man. He's elusive, elusive, elusive. Now, when you got a guy with that kind of speed, the problem is sometimes – he will take, you know, hitting off the edge instead instead of shooting an interior gap sometimes. Um, now, 
He's also had a few injuries, right? Um, I think he had an ACL tear in 2022, had a, a biceps injury at the Senior Bowl. Um, and listen, he's a purely speed guy. He's not going to power through you. That's not his game. But when you talk about a sleeper in this draft, R Rasheen Ali is one of those guys. For sure. One of those guys. For sure. Now, before we get into the big board, one thing I did want to show you guys, look at, we had that contract breakdown of Kendall Lamb come out. Kendall Lamb, um, it, it's not, it's not too bad of a contract at all. One year, 2.575 million, 1.6 million of that is guaranteed. So there you go. There are the numbers for Kendall Lamb. 825,000 signing bonus, 1.6 million guaranteed. Um, and this is it. This is the last ride, as he called it. So add into his bank account on that last ride. You got to love it. You got to love it. All right. All that to say this. Shall we get in to my offensive tackle big board? Shall we get into it? Let's go ahead Let's get into it. Let's start off as we always do with the honorable mentions. At 15, I got Javon Foster out of Missouri, 6'5, 313. Foster has a body frame that gives him prototypical length and size to the position, even if he can afford to increase his weight a bit more. Foster shows a strong upper body and lower body with a sturdy anchor to match in both pass pro and and the run game footwork needs to be cleaned up, especially going into his kick slide. Hand placement needs to be consistently better. Defenders can beat him coming across his face. I don't think he's ideal for an outside zone heavy run team. He's not the quickest to the second level, and open space isn't really his biggest strength. 14, Caden Wallace out of Penn State. Over 6'4", 314, Wallace is a solid option for a team needing help on the right side of their offensive line. He's a good athlete with a good with good power and a sufficient anchor who plays with a good wide base and flashes that on tape, that he can be an absolute force in the run game. The problems are he doesn't have quick feet, needs to show more urgency reaching that second level, and tends to lose leverage battles regularly when because he's caught upright with his pad level too much for my liking. Number 13, Christian Jones out of Texas, 65302. Jones moves a bit better on tape than his testing showed, I thought. As he's a good athlete who played both left tackle and right tackle at Texas. Has good length to his frame, which also possesses, you know, and he also possesses decent core strength as well. Can seal off defenders in the run game while keeping a steady wide base and pass pro with strong hands that he regularly plays as well. Feet aren't the fleetest. Agile speed rushers can give him issues off the edge and isn't that explosive out of his stance. Plus, he needs to be more consistent with his pad level and discipline. He's committed 29 penalties over the last four years got to clean that up uh patrick paul at 12 out of houston at just under six seven and a half and 331 pounds paul is a behemoth of a man who's as dependable as a tackle comes in this class with all of his time at the university of houston spent at left tackle Paul has fantastic length, moves well laterally, has quick feet, and overall is a great athlete given his overall size with a mean side to him as he can make some impact blocks in the run game with a really strong anchor. Where he struggles is with his hand placement, pad level, and he does have problems holding and sustaining blocks at times. All right? And um, next, out of Yale, Kieran... Amagaji, um, six, five, 326 pounds. And like Paul, Kieran has ideal length and size his frame for the position with experience the last few years at left tackle after starting out at left guard with Yale. So he gives you guard flexibility if you want, does Amagaji. Um, packs a lot of power, especially if he lands his initial punch. While he shows underrated quickness in his feet that allow him to reach second levels defenders rather quickly. Um, plays with fire and can miss blocks. He gets caught lunging. Um, he gets caught out of position by overextending and oversetting. 
The leap from Ivy League to the NFL in terms of competition will be huge and needs to clean up his hand placement. He can be way too wide with his hand placement at times, but very intriguing day three prospect. Kieran Amagaji. So let's get in to the top 10 and let's start off at number 10. Let's start off with Roger Rosengarten out of Washington. Rosengarten not only has one of the best names of this class, I think, let's be honest, um, but he's also 6'5", 308. He's a right tackle who was an All-American as a freshman that, you know, he's existed in the draft shadow of Troy Fatanu. That's just where he's at. He's solid in pass pro coming from an offense where he had 1,235 pass blocking reps compared to 713 run block reps over the last two years. So very, very pass heavy over there in Washington, obviously with Penix. He has a quick first step, explosive out of his stance, explodes out of his stance nicely as his short area burst really flashes. Also moves well laterally, displaying good agility for his size. Hands are strong with consistently good placement. Shows a high level awareness for stunts, twists, etc. And can mirror defenders pretty well. Strength is his big, biggest issue all the way from his upper body with his weak initial punches down to his lower body and anchor. Needs to improve big time. And needs to keep his motor running hot more often than not because you feel like he can lose blocks and not keep them sustained because the effort isn't there at times. So he needs to keep running hot, but the tools are there. Number nine out of BYU, Kingsley Suamatea. Kingsley is 6'4", 326 pounds with ideal length and prototypical build for the position with versatility to play either side of the offensive line, I think. What pops off tape where he excels the most is in the run game as he flashes downright dominance with a nasty side and a strong anchor to match. In pass pro, he has the strength to take on a bull rush from a power rusher and the lateral movement with quick feet to take on speed rushers coming off the edge. Gets to the second level fairly quickly, can block well one-on-one -on -one or in open space, and has vice grip hands that can lock out defenders when he gets them in, in, inside their pads and extends, or he can knock them back with a strong punch. He keeps those hands active and violent. Gets caught playing upright way too much. Really needs to better his pad level. Needs to time his get off much better. It's it, it's slow and clunky a little bit. And is still considered a raw prospect as he only had two years of starting experience in college. But the ceiling is high. The ceiling is high for Kingsley Suamatea. He it's big time. Number eight, Jordan Morgan out of Arizona. Morgan stands at six five weighs 311 pounds and possesses some of the cleanest quickest feet of this draft class moves well from into his kick slide all the way to reaching the second level while his feet help him work well with mirroring too and he keeps his feet aligned with his hands in terms of usage he does it well um a really good pass blocker who wins with clean technical handwork more than power and violence um is not only young, but I think he also offers tackle and guard versatility at the next level if a team wants to move him. Needs to improve his overall play strength. Length is just okay, not great. And he is a guy who is, his awareness needs to step up a little bit in terms of picking up stunts and twists and etc. Right? Number seven, Tyler Guyton out of Oklahoma. Coming in at 6'7 and a half, 322 pounds. Guyton moves so smoothly, whether it's how he almost glides into his kick set to how he mirrors defenders, reaches the second level, or how he moves laterally. Absolutely shows a ton of promise in pass pro with good core strength, a sturdy anchor, and he only allowed two sacks over four years between TCU and Oklahoma playing both tackle spots. Remember, he was a transfer. Has strong hands that finish defenders if he latches on with good placement. Has great length to his arms that help him extend and lock out. Plus, shows good awareness on for stunts and twists, etc. Moves defenders consistently off their spot in the run game. Opens lanes and has a motor that keeps running until the whistle. Loses leverage battles with his high pad level that needs to work on. Again, another guy who plays upright. This is a, a theme I saw. Needs more reps. He only had... 1,095 reps over four years, so he's still raw with technique at times. And he can whiff badly with lunges. He can whiff badly with his initial punch. But, I mean, you're talking about a guy who has just under 1,100 snaps. The, the ceiling is huge for Guyton. And again, he played both tackle spots. He can play right or left. 
Number six, Amaris Mims. Mims stands at six seven and a half, weighs in at three forty. And as I've been saying for months, when I watch his tape, he screams Chris Greer with his size, length, and athleticism, making him a high upside prospect who spent his time in college at right tackle. He's an absolute mountain that's hard to you know that's hard for defenders to move, just given his size. But when you add in his strength, he can downright bully defenders at times, almost brushing them to the side as easily as he brushes off his shoulders. The way he moves, given his massive frame, is overly impressive too. IG displays quick feet, moves laterally really well, and has good overall bend from his knees to his hips. Has hands that clamp defenders to displace them or can smash them like two cars colliding with his punch. Shows good time and explosion out of his stance. Maintains good balance while he can sustain his blocks. Experience is going to be the biggest question mark as he didn't even have a 1,000 snaps at the college level, which shows how crazy his ceiling is given his ranking on my board here. Has to keep his motor running with his legs turning more regularly. Has had lower body injuries already. And just needs to tighten his overall technique with more reps. But the ceiling is through the roof. This guy hasn't had a thousand reps. And, and you watch the tape and you're like, holy jeez. Tools and traits for freaking days. Days. And there's even mocks that have him going in the top 20. I'm telling you, the ceiling with the proper coaching and development, this guy could be unreal. He could be. So let's get into the top five. Starting off at five, Troy Fatanu comes in at just over six three and a half, three seventeen, while offering a rare versatility, being that he's not only capable of being one of the best tackles in this class, as seen by him being my fifth rank, but also he has the ability to be maybe the best guard in the draft. Fatanu moves well from his feet, fleet feet, all the way to his independent hand usage. He's smooth moving in open space laterally when he's tasked with pulling or climbing to the second level. Fatanu possesses more than adequate power as he displays a strong punch, punch, drives defenders off their spot to open lanes for running backs, and has streaks in his game where he flashes a downright nasty side. By no means is he a power guy, though. Fatanu is a technician that relies on timing from his get-off at the line of scrimmage to landing a punch while his hands are cons constantly placed in the right position to lock out defenders once he gets them inside their pads. Shows high-level explosiveness out of his stance and in short areas. Really good at sustaining his blocks. He shows high effort with a top-flight motor to his game. Where he needs to improve well, his lower body strength, his anchor can waver against power rushers. He can give up too much of his inside shoulder at times. And I think he needs to be a little bit more patient than aggressive. Because this can get this it can have defenders catch him oversetting, and he needs to definitely clean that up. But yeah, man, I mean this guy's got the tools. He's got the tools. He's got the talent, and I mean you got can either get an answer at left tackle or at left guard with Troy Fatanu in this draft. I truly believe that. I don't think he's just a, a guard. J.C. Latham at four. Latham is six six. 342 pounds, has manned both the guard position and tackle position on the right side of the offensive line at Alabama. Played right guard in 2021, then he shifted to right tackle for the last two seasons. Not only does Latham have the requisite size and length for the position, but his power can pop on film, whether it's from a well-timed punch that can stun a defender, how he opens up lanes by shifting defenders with ease, or when he drops his hits, sets his anchor, and looks immovable off his spot when a defender bull rushes. Latham is quite agile for his size. He can move laterally really well, mirror defenders, and climb quickly to the second level. Has a nasty mauler side to him as he embraces the physical aspect of the game. Can be downright dominant as a run blocker, whether it's sustaining his blocks or driving a defender to open gaps and creases for the ball carrier. Hand placement is normally really good. Has a strong grip to match. Shows good awareness on stunts and twists. And blitz pickups, I think his power and movement ability combined make him viable for gap and zone schemes. While I think given his IQ and previously mentioned athleticism, I think he could jump to the left side tackle position like Jedrick Wills did with the Browns. Not only is he not the greatest mover in open space, I'd like to see him look for more work too when he reaches that second level. Needs to be more disciplined as he has 18 penalties over the last two years. And his recoverability is is just okay. 
it's it's nothing that's gonna blow you away. But Latham at twenty one, I've heard they're interested in him, and he's an intriguing option. Three, Talise Fuaga. Fuaga is just under six six. Weighs 324 pounds and is one of my yearly man crutches of this offensive tackle class, as I've mentioned before. Talk about an absolute stud in pass protection. Fogga didn't allow a single sack over the course of his three years at right tackle with the Oregon State Beavers. I think Fogga, given his athleticism, agility, and high football IQ, he'd have no problem converting the left tackle if a team asked him to. Uh, absolute monster at the point of attack. With downright beastly strength that lets him anchor successfully against bull rushers or bulldozes defenders out of the way to open up running lanes for the ball carrier. Steadily maintains an ideal pad level so he's never caught off balance or washed out due to leverage that, you know, and has that nastiness you like to see in terms of sustaining and he finishes his blocks. Vice grip hands that let him control defenders at the line of scrimmage if he latches on. And they pack more power than a nuclear power plant. When he lands his punches that are deceptively quick, Fogg has speedy feet, which helps him match defenders with good mirroring, helps him in space with pulling and climbing as well. For as good of an athlete as he is, he's not overly explosive out of his stance. I think his footwork can improve a little bit too. He gets a little sloppy at times. And I would say his arm length isn't overly ideal, but I mean, that's me nitpicking. Really, the, le- the top three guys I'm nitpicking to be honest with you, with their weaknesses. But you look at Fuaga, you look at the movement skills, look at it, just wipe out, man. Like, look, look, it's just power, power, power. And movement skills. Strong, strong movement skills. He was really good against UCLA. I mean, look at that pop there, that punch. Just took the man down. Oh, my God. Number two, Olu Fashinu. He's my other man crush of this taco class, coming in at just over six and a half feet. 324 pounds. Olu's functional play strength is elite as he's an absolute force whether he uses his power, lower body strength with his legs to drive a defender out of the way or tosses him like a rag doll with his upper body strength. His hound, hands are powerful and get felt all the way to the root of a defender's family tree when he lands a punch as he keeps them not only violent but very active as well. Keeps a nice sturdy base. His feet are always wide and set. Has good bend to his frame. And a nice strong anchor that makes him a damn near immovable object. Shows explosiveness out of his stance. Crisp footwork into his kick slide. Takes good angles inside or out. Doesn't let defenders across his face. And shows a high level of awareness when it comes to stunts, twists, blitzers, etc. He's really good when tasked in the screen game as he can climb to the next level in the blink of an eye and thrives in open space. He's always got his head on a swivel looking for work. Incredibly high ceiling as he just turned 21 in December. Has prototypical size and build for the position while he has all the traits to succeed with even more room to grow and be coached up, which is scary. Needs to be cleaner with hand placement plus over-aggressiveness can lead to oversetting and balance issues at time when you watch him. But man... You cannot go. I heard rumors of him dropping out of the top fifteen. That's a, that's ridiculous. If if this guy drops out of the top ten, people should be fired. Olu Fashnu is going to be a different maker at the next level. Number one, Joe Alt. He's six eight and a half, three hundred twenty one pounds. Prototypical size and length to his frame, as well as some real power. You know, he had twenty seven bench reps at the combine. Alt might be the best mover in this tackle class. He's so fluid in space or climbing to the second level. Some of the quickest and cleanest footwork while he shows off his agility, but not only moving laterally well, but mirroring defenders with such ease. Super strong at the initial point of attack, whether it be landing a punch to stun an opposing defender or using his hands like a vice grip to lock on and move a defender out of the way to open a run lane. Has great awareness for stunts, twists, and blitz pickups. While I think when you blend his high-level football IQ and size and athleticism, he always seems to take the right angle. I think he can play either tackle spot or even inside a guard if you want him to. Possesses good bend through his frame. Has high-end recovery ability, some of the best recovery ability in this class. If a defender's first move gets the best of him, you know he's not, it's not over. And, you know, he's from an NFL bloodline. His father is former All-Pro and Pro Bowler offensive tackle John Alt of the Kansas City Chiefs. 
He's a complete player from the snap to the whistle, whether it's, you know, timing his get off from the line of scrimmage well with explosiveness or sustaining and finishing off his blocks. His motor, it runs scorching hot. I think he's scheme versatile and will find success with either a pa you know, power gap offense or an outside zone offense. He's that good. Now, he can get caught with his chest open, leaving him susceptible to a bull rush from power rushers. If I'm nitpicking, I've seen him play a little too upright at times, which is giving him leverage issues, but not too often. And I would label him as more of a powerhouse than a tackle with a nasty demeanor. Either way, I'm here to tell you, Joe Alt, he's the best offensive tackle in this class. He's an absolute, absolute stud, man. Absolute stud. Going to be the first tackle off the board. I don't think there's any single solitary doubt about that at all. But you look at his game, man, Joe Alt, he's special. Really, Joe Alt, Olu Fashinu, um, Talise Fuaga, J.C. Latham, Troy Fatanu, Amarius Mims, Tyler Guyton, you know, you know, even Kingsley Sumatea. There are guys here that have ceilings where with the proper coaching and development, they could be home runs. They could be home runs. I'm just saying. And, you know, I'm also confident in saying that they could be home runs if we get them because after what we saw in year one with Butch Berry and Mike McDaniel and Frank Smith, I believe they can develop one of those guys outside the top five into something real good. Real good. Brad, what what uh what what hats did you cough? Let me know what hat what hat you coughed. So man, I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there's uh there is some great great tackle options in this class. I I've heard specifically going back. I've heard JC Latham and Graham Barton are two guys are interested in at 21 and beyond. Um, so there are some legitimate tackle options. Now what I'm planning to do is safety is going to be the next big board. And then I'm going to pivot and do guard after that. And now what's going to happen is after I do all the big boards, I'm going to release the text version of those big boards to the patrons and the channel members. Plus, patrons and channel members will also get my big boards that did not make the video chopping block. So you'll get my quarterback big board. You will get my tight end big board, which would have been next up to make the chopping block. Um, you will get my running back big board. You will get my cornerback big board. You will get my linebacker big board, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Patreons and channel members will see how I see the rest of the positions that don't make, uh, you know, the video chopping block, right? So just an update for all you guys. And then either tonight or tomorrow morning, I will have an update coming for Patreons and channel members. So I want you to also be out on the lookout for that. Um, continuing on with the updates, I'm still trying to work out a day that works with Omar. Um, to have on I know he's trying to get caught up with all these prospects and he wants to be caught up on these prospects before he comes on so I'm giving him his time um, on top of that I'll be back ball game will be back this week on the finish line um, we'll have Finn too deep back on Thursday as Neil will be back from Wrestlemania weekend um, and then I, I'm gonna see I'm gonna try and get that either that safety big board out either Friday or this weekend so more, more, more content coming for you. And then, you know, and then we got, um, guard coming after that. So, and if I'm feeling real nice, maybe I will turn tight end into a video. So we got a ton of draft content. So coming, remember the week of the draft Thursday night and Friday night, I will have panels live for the draft. We were the number one live watch. We were the number one watched live reaction to the draft for both nights last year. Let's do it again this year. Um, that week's gonna be jam packed because we're gonna have um, me and Neil are also gonna have our yearly live three round mock draft, hand selected, pick by pick. Our team and every other team hand selected mock draft. So be on the lookout for that. A lot of content coming your way. Smash the like button. Subscribe if you're new. 
We're getting y'all ready for that draft. And it's not too far away, baby. Let's go. We are we are 17 days away. Two and a half weeks. Here we go. Smash the like button. Subscribe if you're new. You already know what time it is. Fins up all day, every day. Appreciate all of you who support. Appreciate all of you who donated. All of you who took the time to smash the like button. Those donations go far away on a video like this, which is probably going to get demonetized. So shout out to all of you. And I will catch y'all on the next one. Fins up all day, every day until Margaritaville sends us season to sister our way. Take it easy, guys.